I'll just start by saying, what a me ora nora, nyama garo in na wo ngara, ugi anke titila kali. Jurulai bai me goni toko nurupa, jurulai dara gariko nurupa. Um, in, in short, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional people and pay my respects to our elders past and present. Um, to our creator, I call him Baiami, to our Mother Earth, um, and more importantly to our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters that I share this, this great country with uh, today. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about um, traditional society and how, how that impacts on our health today. Uh, and so it's a little bit of a history lesson, but then we'll also go into some t um, statistics and, and hopefully um, we'll pull it in the long run to um, some options or, or some programs that are, are running that are, are kind of um, combating um, Aboriginal men's health. Uh, I've, I first got into Aboriginal men's health by kind of accident. I fell into it a bit and Someone came to me and said, you're interested in men's health, and, you know, and in particular Aboriginal men's health. I said, oh yeah, I'm Aboriginal and I gotta stay healthy. So yeah, I'll, I'll be interested in that. And then, and then someone asked me, do I wanna help uh, run the, the um, men's wellbeing or health conference uh, a few years ago? And that's where I, I, love, uh, I met these beautiful men um, to my right over here who have so much knowledge in this, in this space and who've taught me uh, a lot. And, one thing um, I, I really loved about these guys is that I often used to say that in, in men's health, Aboriginal men were, were left behind. And, and these two men were really adamant about making sure that conversation happens and invite me along to a lot of things. And um, so by no means am, am I an expert, but, um, but I, I try and present the knowledge that I do have. So I hope it, it fits with you. Um. Can everyone hear me if I talk like this? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. White fella magic don't sit well with me, eh? Uh, there we go. We've got a few laughs. That's good. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a concept called Nurumpa. Uh, Nurumpa, or the word Nurumpa is a Nyempa word, and it basically means my camp and my relationship with everything in it, um, in an English translation. Um, to us, it means a lot more than that. So my camp is everything I come into contact with. So, and my relationship with everything that I come into contact with. So you guys are all now part of my Nurumpa. Um, you're part of my story and I'm a part of yours. Um, traditionally, that was everything. So for, and it encompasses our law or L-O-R-E and our traditional lifestyle. So non-Indigenous people weren't a part of the law or the Nurumpa traditionally because you weren't here. Now that you're here, you're now part of that Nurumpa. So anyone that comes to Australia is now part of Australia's dreaming or part of their Nurumpa. Does that kind of make sense for everyone? Yep, cool. Um, now our law was made up or our Nurumpa of concentric circles. Now within these circles would be everything. So our land, our culture, our spirit, our songs, our stories, um, plants, animals, anything you can think of was part of this structure. And as time goes on, whenever something new is introduced, we just add another circle. So our culture's ever evolving and ever connected to everything. So it's just like when you chuck a, a pebble in, in the river and it, the ripples go out and out and out, it's the same kind of process. Traditionally, health and well-being was a massive part of this Nurumpa. So our ways of being, our spirituality, our physical health was all a really important part of Nurumpa. And I don't know if anyone's seen a photo of, of Aboriginal people living traditionally. They definitely didn't have this extra bit of weight that I've got around my belly. They were strong, stoic people. Um, very strong um, physically, um, spiritually and emotionally, and very proud people. Uh, and what's happened over time and, and through colonisation is that these concentric circles that were once connected to everything started to disappear. And as they disappeared, so did our health, so did our well-being, so did our emotional stability, and also our roles as men um, were part of that. 
Um, I'm going to speak mainly from a men's perspective, so I do apologise to the women in the house. But, um, and what that did to our people is lead to the health outcomes we all see nowadays. So we see Aboriginal um, peoples and, and men on the bottom of every social determinant in Australia. Um, you know, from high levels of incarceration to poor employment outcomes, poor um, educational outcomes, um, and obviously what impacts on that is obviously very poor health outcomes. The reason I'm saying this is when you take a dominant culture and you stick it over the top of another culture, and that culture no longer has room to breathe or thrive, then we're going to see these outcomes nonetheless. Now, every single tribe in Australia has been colonised at one point. We've all come from stone tools. We've all come from living from the land. Um, at some point, no matter who you are, you have been colonised on a level. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here with pens and papers and doing what we do now. Um, and that's, that's a really important thing to hold into your minds because what happens over that time of colonisation and building is that first you see a downfall of these things and then you start to see a re rebuild um, or these circles start to change. Does that kind of make sense for everyone? So we start to either repair some of what's happened and then we might add some new things as well in order to piece back the bits of culture. Why has this led to our health being so poor? Is one, again, introduced foods, sugars, um, those types of things, alcohol. We didn't have alcohol traditionally. We did have similar things called Kwandong juice, but it wasn't necessarily alcohol. Um, and it's led kind of to the demise of our people. What I'm more focused on in, in my stuff though is the spiritual downfall and how the lack or the loss of spiritual connection has led our people to the path they're at. Um, and I believe Aboriginal men have lost their place because when we had these circles and this law taken from us, we didn't replace it with anything. And as society kind of started to really impact on Aboriginal men, you start to see Aboriginal women step up a lot more. And again, the men had lost their place, which led to um, a whole heap of, of loss of culture. Another thing that that took was our rites of passage. So colonisation really smashed rites of passage. I believe it's a massive thing that Aboriginal men or all men across the board are now missing out on, is rites of passage. Um, for us, there was a point where we hit a certain age and basically we were taken from the women, given to the men, and we would go through a man-making ceremony. Again, it's another part that we've lost, or hasn't lost, but um, that has impacted on our health outcomes. Um, we now have boys that are number one raising children. We have boys that turn 18 and their rite of passage is to go and get drunk. And more importantly, we now have boys who think their rite of passage is to go to jail. So when I'm spending time in communities, I hear a lot of Aboriginal youth going, that's when I go to jail, that's when I'm a man. And this is that convict um, ethos that we've carried in Australia, is that we, we're now creating generation after generation that are going to jail. What I believe some of the answers to this is, is actually putting back some of those things. So when I look at health, spiritual and emotional well-being, I like to go back to our traditional heritage. And we start teaching our youth and men about foods, medicines, things that we used in order to get strong. Uh, we also go back and we start talking about our spiritual ways of being, so, um, which aren't Christianity. Uh, they're actually, we had our own spiritual beliefs and, and our own religious structures. Why do I talk to them about that? Because it's all part of our massive well-being. Some of the issues when we look at programs nowadays with Aboriginal men or youth and health is that we're taking a white structure and we're putting that onto Aboriginal people. We've been doing it for 228 years. We take a belief structure that good health means you have to go to a doctor and a doctor's going to diagnose you with something and then he's going to treat you. 
The wording's all wrong. They're white words. If I talk to an Aboriginal community about healing versus treatment, I get a lot more better responses. And so we need to start changing the conversation around how we deal with Aboriginal communities, um, and especially in the ways of health. So if you talk to an Aboriginal man about spiritual well-being, he can sit down and talk to you about all these things. And we can understand that when I have a smoking ceremony, that's actually good for my well-being. When my well-being's strong, I can get my health and my other, other um, areas of my life strong as well. But the problem is we're talking about treatment and we're not changing our dialogue around things. Does that kind of make sense for people? It's the same thing when we're talking about health in general, men's health. We're constantly putting this stuff in a white framework. It doesn't work for Aboriginal people. It doesn't work for a lot of cold communities because of our cultural differences. So in my society, Aboriginal man's job is to spiritually guide his family. It also means that I'm the last to eat, so I don't eat first. I always wait until everyone else has eaten, the women and the children first. It means I constantly need to put my family and my community first. In a white context, and I'm not knocking white society, we say we've got to look after us first. We look after us, and then we look after our own. We don't look after our community and our family and then ourselves. And so there's this kind of structure that sits with Aboriginal people where they, they struggle with that. They struggle with, okay, everyone here's out for themselves, but I've only had 228 years where I haven't thought of anyone else but my community. And so to live isolated now as an Aboriginal man or as an Aboriginal um, father is really just backwards for me. Does that kind of make sense for people? So. When we come to these spaces, I sit and I listen, and the stats tell themselves, but I also sit and I go, oh, hang on, that's backwards for me. That's not how I live my life. The same thing for cold communities, you know, is that cold communities are often struggling with how we interpret our health and our ways and well-being. So it's something I, I like to push across. Um, so now when I develop programs, especially around health for youth, I use concentric circles. I don't use boxes because our mob don't fit into boxes and a circle doesn't fit into a box. So I start to use this Nuremberg concept for them. And I piece these together and I, I basically put their, their health in the middle and then from there we start to work outwards. And so there's a cultural construct that our youth are getting and they're starting to understand it. And we've just had Uniting Care take this construct on and they've changed their whole organisational structure from a hierarchical box structure to a circle bar, um, structure. So we start with health and then, you know, well-being. Um, then we go to physical and we, we basically work our way out there. What I'm trying to get across is that we need to stop putting a white framework first and the black stuff behind it. We need to put the black knowledge first and the white stuff behind it. Does that kind of make sense for people, like yeah. what I'm trying to say there? Um, so when I'm talking about um, well-being, I'm not saying, bro, you need to go see a psych, you need to get your head sorted. What I'm saying is, bro, you need to come sit in the bush with me. You need to sit down and we're going to have a smoking ceremony and we're going to have a talk and then we're going to devise a plan together from there. So first step is I'm flexibly delivering something different. First step is I'm affirming them in their culture, in who they are. Second step is they might tell me a story about depression or they might tell me a story about struggling with, with um, being a father. And so instead of saying, hey, there's this great white program I know about called Parents Not Partners, or there's this great program I know about called Triple P Parenting. It's not going to affirm him in his knowledge. It's going to say to him that white fellas know everything. And I'm not knocking people, please don't take it that way. It's my language, so I've got to be conscious of that. What I say is go, ah, oh, bro, there's this old dreaming yarn about this emu fella. And that, that emu woman, she comes and she lays those eggs. But do you know whose job it is to look after those hatchlings? It's the male emu. So that male emu, he sits on that eggs until they hatch. 
and then he rears those children. And so what I've done straight away is I've affirmed that Aboriginal person in their cultural way of being. In 75,000 years worth of knowledge and cultural power. We're saying to that Aboriginal man, you know the truth. You know how we do it and we've done it well. Then what I say is, hey, there's one way of looking at it. But then there's this great white program that also assists with this stuff. So what I've done is I've given him a cultural framework and then I've sat the white knowledge. Because as much as we need black fillers, we also need our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters walking with us. We didn't create, we didn't break this system up ourselves. It was in place, we didn't break it up ourselves. We're not going to be able to put it back together ourselves. And that's where I'm, I'm really strong in saying that we need to push and walk forward together. I'm a professional and there's some parts of my job that I don't like doing and for some people they may not like working with black fellas or cold or, or other people but as a professional it's my job to actually gain the skills I need. As a professional it's also my job to give you the skills you need and to upskill people in order to understand the differences. This will tie back to health so I'm getting there. Um, so. I try and explain these concepts because I think the conversation needs to happen. For, I'm, I'm only 32 so I'm still a spring pup, but for those 30 years I've heard my dad, he's now 73, war veteran, um, talk about the same issues, same, same cultural issues. And I come into him one day, I said, Dad, I've had enough of this conversation. He said, why? I said, because it's not working. It's not working. We need to change our conversations. It's the same thing when I listen to health or I listen to domestic violence outcomes. We know that one in three women are, per are victims of domestic violence. We know that one in three men are obviously perpetrators of domestic violence. What we're not talking about is the two men that aren't perpetrators of domestic violence. And where, where we need, yes, to put out the, the more darker stats because people need to build an understanding, we also need to start bringing the positive stuff to light. And so it's something that I'm trying to do is utilise our cultural knowledge in order to affirm our people in who they are. So here comes the stats, because we've all got to have stats, because you're not legitimate unless you have some stats. Uh -oh. So life expectancy of Aboriginal people in New South Wales is 70 years, or 70.5 years. Non-Aboriginal people are 79.8 um, years in New South Wales. Queensland, Aboriginal men um, live for 68.7 years. And in Queensland, non-Aboriginal men live for 79.4 years. WA is 65 years um, for Aboriginal men. Non-Aboriginal is 80.1. NT, 63 years. And um, in, for non-Indigenous people, it's 77 years. We've been talking for about 20 years now around closing the gap. Well, it's a more recent thing, but as far as that, that strategic um, plan is roughly about 20 years. And we still are seeing a life expectancy difference of about 15 years. I believe that this is one of the answers to that. I believe that if we're gonna truly close the gap, we need to start affirming Aboriginal people in who they are. Instead of kicking them in the guts and saying that we know better, we need to say, you've got the knowledge, what worked traditionally, how do we pull that into a 21st century context? And that's a real important thing. And I think it works for cold people, works for a whole heap of people. Um, for Aboriginal people, the biggest uh, death uh, or reason we die is heart disease. It's actually the biggest, um, biggest killer throughout the world for non-Indigenous or Indigenous men. Um, suicide rates is that we're pretty much double or as likely to commit suicide than anyone else. So throughout Australia, 12.5 um, um, people per 100,000 um, die of suicide compared to the Aboriginal rate of 22.5 people per 100,000. Why is this happening? Again, because of the disconnection that's happened for our people. In saying that, we need people to bear with us. So, if, has anyone got a watch on? Yeah? 
If I was to take your watch and smash it into a thousand pieces, how long would that take me with a hammer? Second. Second? Yeah. If I wanted to pick that watch up and place every single piece back together and create a working watch again, how long would that take me? Forever. May not be able to happen. So we do need people to bear with us as well. We also need people to work with us in this space. We need your knowledge to get involved in this space and to assist in it. And the only way to do that is with an open heart. Aboriginal people, when they come into a health setting, will pick you straight away. You know, if, if you really don't want to be there, we'll know pretty quickly. And so it's important to understand that because of that 228 years that's happened, and has been all bad, um, but because of that history, our people are always really sus. And so therefore sometimes we make relationships hard. And I'm not taking all the blame on, on our people, but I'm also not putting all the blame on non-Indigenous people as well. But know that it takes time to build a rapport. So when, when Glenn first come over and he's an Englishman, of course I'm kind of sus on him going, you know, hey, I, I got some payback that I need to owe you. And, uh, but we've built a beautiful relationship. And it wasn't that way. He's a beautiful man. Um, but it's important to, to kind of understand that. Um, I kind of then want to look at basically the impact the intervention has had on our Aboriginal communities. Everyone knows about the intervention? Yeah, kind of. So the intervention was um, basically instilled in Northern Territory on the Aboriginal communities, the only race of people at the time that it was instilled on. And it was instilled or enacted under the proviso that uh, Aboriginal men um, were molesting children. And the rest of society hears that there's children being molested. We all give the go-ahead for something to happen. What that did was, so number one, there was a massive inquiry into it, and the, um, the police actually, in their police report, and the police, historically one of the most racist organisations in Australia, um, basically came out and said, no, these Aboriginal men aren't molesting children. They still enacted the intervention anyway. And they actually had to suspend the Racial Discrimination Act in Australia in order to put that in place. So that should tell you something. It just so happens as well that those communities are on the biggest uranium deposits in the world. Didn't say anything, but... Um, so what that did was further disempower Aboriginal men. So at the moment, as we see a, a suicide rate that's so high, um, and in the NT, Aboriginal men in WA are actually dying another five to eight years before um, a typical Aboriginal man in New South Wales is, is because of these ongoing and systemic racist policies. So when you are so heavily constricted in how you can live life and where you can go and what you can do, that has a huge impact on people. So it's a massive issue when we start having non-Indigenous governments make policies for our people. The point I'm trying to make is those policies are directly involved with the poor outcomes or health outcomes of Aboriginal men. They're directly involved. They're not helping the issue with closing the gap. They're actually assisting with, with keeping those stats down. Uh, and that might be a little bit controversial for people to hear, um, and I understand that. Um, but it's, to me, the evidence is pretty clear. Does anyone work with Aboriginal clients directly in here? Got a couple of people? Oh, nice. Right. Has anyone met Aboriginal people in here? <laughs> awesome. Cool. All right. <laughs> That's a positive thing. Um, so, realistically, those of you that are working with Aboriginal clients, what I think the best way to do or go about their emotional and health wellbeing plans are is to look at what, what their actual cultural connection is and trying to utilise that in order to come across and work with their health. Um, for those of you who don't work with blackfellas, it's probably not relevant, but I think it's, um, it's, it's a good knowledge to have nonetheless. I think we need to start changing the 
dialogue with uh, Aboriginal men and we need to start affirming them in who they are. Because once they're affirmed in who they are, their actual ability to take control of their communities and, um, sorry, and to develop better health is um, paramount. So we're now using this um, a group of people called Nunkaris. And the Nunkaris are a group of Aboriginal healers that are now trying to get recognised through Medicare Local. Uh, once they're recognised, they can actually be seen as a legitimate arm of healing. What they're doing is they, at the moment, they do a lot of their work for free um, and they're travelling around Australia and they're spending a lot of time with community. What they're doing is healing. So they're actually using a whole range of um, probably um, traditional medicines, but also, um, you know, things like kinesiology um, in traditional practice in order to, to heal them. They've had an overwhelming response to their practice. So when they're going to Aboriginal communities, they're actually booking out within minutes. So they're only spending a few days. They're booking out and the outcomes, there's a study happening on the outcomes of um, health. Um, but I do kind of implore everyone to start reading up on that. Just like we acknowledge, um, you know, Chinese medicine as part of, of you know, a, a legitimate form of medicine. These Nunkaris are doing the exact same thing. So the knowledge that they possess around bush medicines, um, has anyone heard of the new cancer treatment called Gumby Gumby that they're actually trying? So there's some um, studies now going on from a plant called Gumby Gumby, which is attacking um, tumours in people. And that's a traditional medicine that we've used to, to heal cancer forever. They've just, they've just started human trials on it. Um, and so the knowledge base there is really important. So start drawing on the knowledge base Aboriginal people have which is huge. When it comes to Aboriginal um, suicide, so we've basically taken this uh, construct and embedded it in a youth program called the Family Wellbeing Program that we're running on the Central Coast. It's actually developed by some elders in Western Australia and we've taken and adapted it. The Family Wellbeing Program is funded by the, the government, so, um, but also Charles Darwin University doing a whole range of study on it at the moment. Basically what it is, is using cultural knowledge in order to combat suicide. What we've done is we just take a youth of at-risk youth, so uh, Aboriginal males, and we've started to embed our cultural um, ways of being into them. So this concept is the first part of that. Throughout the program, what we do is we actually give them a whole list or range of choices in their life. So same thing as the intervention with the intervention took, Aboriginal people's choices, um, we're actually giving that back to our youth. What's happening from those programs is not only are we preventing suicide, so we had, out of the first 16 we had, nine of them said they have quite deep suicidal thoughts um, every day, and basically we're at risk. Some, two of them had tried suicide previously. One couldn't talk because he actually tried to hung, hang himself and his voice box um, no longer worked and he had tempted again um, before the program. We took the youth and we handed their cultural knowledge back to them and empowered them through culture. We started to teach them what Aboriginal men were and how we carried ourselves using these ethos and in that ethos we basically taught them what we call the six L's. One, two, three. And the six L's are really simple. We teach them the law, so L-O-R-E. Now the law is connected to the Norumpa. Sorry, can everyone see that? Law, L-O-R-E is connected to the Norumpa, so the law is part of everything. And it's basically, if I was to draw this circle and actually explain law to you, or the Norumpa, law would be the centre of it. So we started teaching them about their law, and that involved traditional dreaming stories, it involved uh, taking them on the country, teaching them about their country, it involved eventually putting them through a man-making ceremony, through, um, through our cultural practices. So we started to teach them their law. At this point in time, their law, though, was to build better emotional well-being. That was all they had to worry about initially, was to build their emotional well-being. How did we do that? 
again through going out on the country. So a whole range of studies that say that when people are connecting with the earth on a greater, greater level, so when people actually take their shoes off and put their ground in the earth, the earth's natural magnetics will actually assist in healing them. Uh, we strengthen their emotional um, strength through spiritual healing. So basically through smoking ceremony. So I'm not saying, you know, we lay our hands on people and they're healed or anything like that. It's through that process. So through making boomerangs, clap sticks, those types of things, we're actually teaching them mindfulness. It's teaching them to stand still long enough. It was teaching them how to self-soothe. So all these things we were doing through traditional practice with these youth. So whenever they were getting agitated, when they were getting um, suicidal, they would pick up their clap sticks and start working on them. And it again, would ground them really heavily. Then we taught them another, probably uh, another one, which was love. So once they started to love the law, once they started to love themselves and actually look after themselves, they started to, to get better. Then we talk them a little bit further. We taught them to look, listen, and learn. Took them out on the country and we got them to look. Look around, what's around them. So we started to look for bush medicines. Started to look at the animals. When that kangaroo injures himself, what does he do? He goes and lays down and relaxes. Why does he relax? Oh, because he needs sleep. Why does he need sleep? Because when he's sleeping, he's able to let his body to heal himself. So how does that fit with someone who's struggling with suicidal thoughts? I need to listen to my body. My body's telling me something's not right. Internally, I'm struggling with something. Okay, so we're looking at that, we're listening to that. What are you learning from that? Well, I learned that every time I have to deal with this certain situation, Every time I have to deal with, with some of the hardships at home, like dad being, you know, drinking heavily or something like that, I actually start to get really depressed. And when I get really depressed, I start to have suicidal thoughts. Okay, so we've looked, we've listened, we've learned something. What do we need to do about that? Well, when I look out on country, when I spend time on country, when I pick up my clap sticks, I actually start to make myself feel better. So he's looked, he's listened, he's learnt different behaviours in order to self, um, self-soothe. We don't do this alone, I must admit, so we have counsellors that are with us throughout the whole program and psychologists, and so we team the kids up because it's not enough just to say, hey, traditional culture is going to solve all the answers. It's not right. But what I'm saying is it's a different way to actually solve the answers. What I'm saying is it changes our mindset on how we deal with these kids. Once we've got all through those, we can lead. I do apologise for the overlapping, but we can lead after that. So some of our children or youth that have gone through the program, that have now actually been through ceremony, um, and they're, they're young adults now, so we start when they're 14 and we run them right through till they're 18. So we don't leave their side. We create a community around that child um, or that youth and we keep going with them and going with them and going with them. So that means court appearances, it means you know, getting kids to meetings, it means dealing with, with friends and family, dealing with um, drug taking or substance abuse, everything along their journey. And then after that, they've started to lead. So some of those youth are now part of um, a leadership group that actually come in and assist. Um, part of that is that we get them onto employment, we get them through the HSC, those types of things. So that's just one example of how a traditional concept can actually change a whole heap of youth life. So there is a massive study on that. Um, if you go to Charles Darwin University and look up Family Wellbeing Program, you'll get all the stats on it. It's been running for eight years, I believe. Um, and, and the, the statistics speak for themselves. So. Um, so as I said, it's about changing those conversations and really allowing people um, or our community to be affirmed in who they are. 
again, some of those impacts of colonisation. So what happened with the stolen generation is that we removed a whole generation who had access to this knowledge. So um, as far as I know, there's about six, seven hundred men throughout this state that are still practising ceremony. So what we're trying to do is to get these types of programs out there. Um, but something as simple as, if, when I say affirming people in who they are, we can research Dreamtime stories all the time. So if you Google Dreamtime stories, you'll have thousands come up at you. And so everyone has access to those stories and that's, that might be a starting point, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and, and so you, you will find a story that correlates. So within every single Dreamtime story, I call them Norman Pass stories, there's a moral. And there's probably three or four morals. And so you can pull those morals out and use them for education. That was the whole point of those stories were, were our education. So anyone can access this stuff and also take little bits out of it. Um, I completely agree there's a massive gap. It's not taught properly at schools. Um, people are taught that Aboriginal people just wandered around the country for no reason and we didn't have any spirituality or, or connection or, you know, and we, we all killed one another. And, those, they're, they're just myths, they're, they're not true. Yeah, I, and I totally agree. I totally, uh, this culture and these, they're not ours to own, they're for everybody to own. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think lots of people can learn from it. And if it was taught properly, then a lot of people wouldn't have the racial issues that they have because they actually have a deeper understanding of, of Aboriginal society. But we, we play a part in that too. So, because a lot of our knowledge is so sacred, we don't share it with people. And when we don't... Sh Does anybody know, except my medical students, I think, because I already told them this one, so no answering Vinay and George. Does anybody know why in countries like Africa and India and Asia, there are more wild elephant attacks than there has ever been? Anybody want to have an educated guess? Progress. Yes? Progress, yep. Yeah. Deforestation, yeah. but that's not the answer. People. People encroaching, yep, yeah, that's part of it, but it's not the answer. Population, if you give me five bucks, I'll tell you the answer. No, nobody? Poaching, poaching. Poaching. Because we kill off all the big bulls with, as they are the big tuskers, and there are no big bulls left to keep the younger bulls in check. Now think about that when Glenn, I think, talked about the family makeup and how that dynamic has changed, where we have more single parents now. And think about how that impact on our young people, especially our young men, and how that works. So I know it sounds a bit out there, but you can relate it back to our societies and how the way we raise uh, children and the way our society works. Is that quite often, as some of our speakers have said, uh, men are often missing and that rite of passage and I've just done a recent study on the rite of passage, not with necessarily within the indigenous population, but within other populations. I don't know if you've seen the Foxtel Tim Noon, uh, Boy to Man, where he's gone around 10 different tribes and undertaken the rite of passage. But even within the rite of passage, sometimes we relate that to risk taking with men and behaviours, you know, such as sticking your hands in bull ant nests and, you know, going and hunting down a lion to prove your manhood. And, that, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but often um, I know within uh, the Anglo culture, uh, it's missing almost altogether, that rite of passage. So these things we need to, often too, um, Stuart opens a lot of eyes when he talks because my family's been here since the 1800s and I am surprised at what I don't know about Indigenous people, what I don't know. And we've been here since 1859. You'd think I'd know a little bit more, but I don't, and most of us don't, because most of us only, as Sid related to, hear what the government tells us. 
the stuff that happened in Northern Territory, it happens in the Northern Territory. We don't deal with it down here, so we don't want to know about it. But it had a big impact, and as he said, a lot of it is around the mining. And not only does it have an impact on the Indigenous people, but it has an impact on the land, which is traditionally theirs. And we know that, you know, it, it leaves a lot of the land in a mess. So these are things. The, the fact that as a Western society we rely on pharmaceutical goods. And we know now that some of those pharmaceutical goods are not working for us. We know that antibiotics are not working. So maybe we need to look back, uh, back a little bit to our past and to the indigenous past and the healing process and the, the, the use of natural resources in order to heal us instead of relying on pharmaceutical goods that we don't know what goes into, we have no idea what they put in those things and believe you, as somebody that spent a little bit of time working for a company that made um, vitamin tablets you don't want to know what I put in half those batches okay, a lot of it is just pure talc powder and nothing else so you're not getting anything from it so it is time to look back sometimes to our, uh, the past in order to move forward into the future.